So we're here talking pints. Michael, yeah. uh, let's just firstly focus on those horrendous events that took place last week yes. uh, down in, in Leon C. Yes. Um, it was interesting to me. Everybody was talking about the need for a calmer, gentler politics, a different discourse, a change of narrative. And yet, it seems pretty clear to me, with all the evidence, that the main suspect is somebody who was uh, referred to the Prevent programme, uh, who uh, was a fan of Anjum Traudry, according to his friends, and that this was, in fact, um, Islamic terrorism. And yet, people seem very reluctant to call it out for what it was. It's his name. Uh, I don't know if anyone's commented on that, but it's Ali Harbi Ali, which means Ali who wages war, Ali. Now, who gave him that name, I'd like to know. I don't know, but mm. it's interesting. Mm. Uh, I actually worked with David Amos on this. I mean, he's a friend of mine. And uh, one of the things we worked on was uh, how communities are getting isolated and that gives room for radicalization. Not everyone is radicalized, of course, but, but some are. And this is uh, an example of that, of living in a kind of atmosphere that nurtures this kind of hatred of the West, of Christians, of Jews, uh, in different ways. I don't think you can blame it all on the social media. I think there no, is... No, nor do I. No. That's right. I think no. it has to be... And so I think we have to address this communal issue uh, that has arisen because of uh, well-meant but uh, mistaken policies of multiculturalism, etc. Uh, and that has meant isolated, ghettoized communities where it's more possible for young people like this chap to be radicalized. Now, you, of course, grew up in a minority group. Yes. You were a Christian. You yes. became a Christian at a relatively young age growing up in a predominantly Muslim country. Was, was that difficult in Pakistan in those days? Well, it wasn't in those days. You see, it was quite possible for Muslims and Christians to live amicably together. I mean, I went to a Catholic school, mm. uh, but the majority of pupils were Muslim. And then there were some Christians, or some were Catholic and some were not. Uh, and we all got on well together, you know, in, in the school and, and in, the, in our neighborhoods and so on. But it's this vision... Uh, that has been created by radical Islamism uh, of a kind of jihadist mentality of changing the world through force of arms. Mm. And that is not just in fringe groups. Uh, I mean, this is being encouraged by countries. Uh, Turkey, for instance, at the moment is vigorously promoting a return to uh, Ottoman uh, uh, the Ottoman imperial era uh, and how the Ottomans governed very large Christian and other communities. Well, this gives a kind of mindset to people. Um, and um, in Pakistan now, the trust and the friendship and so on has often been replaced by suspicion, distrust, violence even. Mm. And you came to this country, and of course I... Got to meet you some time ago when you were Bishop of Rochester because yes. that's the diocese that, you know, I lived in and you confirmed one of my children and all the rest of it. So I was fo followed your career very closely. And about 20 years ago, I thought, wow, this guy's going to become the Archbishop of Canterbury. I mean, you were in the top two or three runners and riders. Uh, there, was a, there was a genuine prospect that, that you could get the job. It didn't happen. There was quite a, a vicious campaign fought against you by the Times newspaper day after day after day there was storm, but in a sense any form of election can be bitter, can be bloody, but you you stood for something and you stood for an Anglican church and I'm sure there are millions of people in this country, the majority over a certain age in this country who grew up understanding that the Church of England was the established church of this country, that the Queen was at the head of it and it was to that church that we looked for some form of guidance, yes. of leadership. And I know you've now decided you can't stay with the Anglican Church, despite the years of long service you've given it, and you're joining the ordinate of the 
Catholic Church. What's gone wrong? What's happened to the Church of England? What's happened to Anglicanism? Yeah, I think there are a number of levels to this. So when people go to church, I mean, take it at the very basic level, they go there um, to encounter the divine in whatever way they think of it. They go there to pray about their needs. They go there to get guidance, as you were just saying. Yeah. But if they are then confronted by a kind of activism of different kinds, informed perhaps by critical theory, and you have uh, basically a kind of view that divides people into victims and villains, uh, then, of course, they don't go. Or if they go, they are frustrated. Similarly, I mean, at the other level, the establishment uh, level, the role of the church has been to provide moral guidance uh, to the nation. But if the church is itself uncertain about what that moral guidance might be, then, you know, what is the point of the establishment? Um, I mean, I would say, uh, really, that even if there was no established church, the role of Christianity in providing a point of departure for urgent moral questions that come up in policy making and legislation, I mean, is absolutely vital because you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, there is no neutrality. And on beginning of life issues, what to do with the early embryo, assisted dying is now topical, uh, marriage and family, justification of conflict when that happens. I mean, all of this. Uh, you need a point of departure. Of course, you need a contribution from all sorts of other areas of life as well, but the church has to be clear about what it... It's almost to... evaporated. It, 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 it's, it's hardly a part of the lives of ordinary people. And I felt, during the pandemic, I mean, when this, when this virus first emerged, yeah. a lot of people were very scared. I think we were all a little bit scared when it first emerged. It was unknown. We had no idea just how much damage it might do. And people who were self-employed found they, their businesses couldn't operate yeah. and we were told to stay at home, uh, to do a series of things that were completely unnatural to us, uh, not able to go and visit friends, relatives, attend funerals, and all of these things. Yeah. A very big emotional impact on everybody in some way. Yeah. You know, children not being allowed to be children. And all of these things happened. Yes. I don't remember hearing anything from the Archbishop of Canterbury during all of this. I don't remember any leadership being there, if ever there was a moment, it seemed to me, ever there was a moment for the church to step up and to give us some hope, it was then. And I just felt it was missing completely. Yeah. Well, I wrote two articles in the Daily Telegraph about this, the compulsory closure of churches. I mean, there is no evidence that with proper distancing and proper safety measures that anyone has ever been infected with COVID in a church. But OK, take all the right measures. I'm not against that at all. I pleaded in this article, it was Easter time, for people yeah. at least to be able to gather in the parks and the you know, open spaces. To worship. Yeah, to worship, yeah. Uh, Easter day. Yeah. And that was not allowed. I mean, people were allowed uh, street choirs, and of course they were allowed to come out and bang uh, saucepans <laughs> and kettles and so forth uh, for the National Health Service, but yeah. not a sim even a simple act of worship outside. The church went even further than the state and prohibited its own clergy from entering their own churches even to conduct a service online. I mean, this is just, this should never happen again. It's an interference in a basic freedom, which is the freedom to worship. Um, and I think the government has actually taken our protest seriously because in subsequent lockdowns, uh, places of worship have been advised mm. how to behave, but they've not been uh, shut down. And I think that is how it should remain. Yeah, it was the first time since 1200. Well, yes. Well, the, the, the churches yes, have I been... Mean, it's, um, oh, yes. Unbelievable. Well, so you were, in a sense, for standing up for the things that you believed in, effectively becoming a rebel within your own church, weren't you? Well, I'm not a rebel. I'm actually quite conservative. I mean, I, I just want the church to be what it is supposed to be and not some kind of activist lobby. But you've left it. Well, yes, um, because I felt that 
I mean, there are two, two areas, really. One, that the church cannot make a decision uh, about its own life which sticks. When it makes a decision, people just go and do their own thing. Secondly, there's no one to tell people, you know, th I'm not saying that this should be promiscuous, that church leaders should always be telling people how to live their lives, but sometimes there come t um, uh, opportunities when you, uh, or necessities when you have to say to people, look, this is the way to go. And if the church can't do that, then you have to ask, well, what is it for? No, I, I understand that. Well, are you, say, as a Catholic, are you, but how active are you going to be? Well, the ordinariate that I'm joining is yes. actually has, is allowing the good things in Anglicanism to be retained. Because you're a married man with family. Well, that, married clergy is one yes, thing. Yes, yes. But also the, the Book of Common Prayer. I mean, the ordinariate uses Cranmer and the beautiful language of the Book of Common Prayer more, I think, than most <laughs> Church of England churches. Probably true. Yeah, yeah. it does. Um, approaches to reading the Bible and using it for guidance. Uh, how to guide people morally. I mean, the, the Roman Catholic Church's tradition of, of that has come through thinking about the confessional. But, the, but Anglican thinking about moral issues has come through involvement in the wider community. And I think this is something we can bring to the wider church. So there are some good things that should be preserved. Um, yep. And I would want to play a role in, in doing that. But equally, we can learn from the wider church about how to act together, about when it is right for the church to pronounce on a matter uh, for the sake of wider society. And when you're not involved, you're a big cricket fan, I know. Well, I've played cricket in the past, and um, I suppose I could still play a bit, but... <laughs> <laughs> and what do you, you know, one thing, Nigel, that I that got me into teams where I didn't deserve to be, said I can bowl with either arm. Can you? Well, I could, could, could. Yeah, OK, yeah, right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Could, could, yes. You could bowl with... A, and, and the same type of delivery with either arm? No, no. Um, it used to be sort of, well, medium-ish with the right arm. Yes. And um, left arm spin. Well, there we are, you see. You get people here, like Michael Nazarelli, <laughs> on Talking Pints. You think you know absolutely everything about them, but you don't. The guy could bowl with either arm. That was Michael Nazarelli joining me on Talking Pints.